Welcome one, welcome all. I'm Bridger. And I'm Cali Thulu. We're from the brand new podcast, Tales of Citizens. And today we're going to reveal to you the top five reasons to be interested in Star Citizen. Number five, Ambitious Scale. Star Citizen is a huge game. To say that it's a persistent, massively multiplayer online space sim is to barely scratch the surface. To say that it also has a single player campaign called Squadron 42, which can also be played co-op, which will bring back brilliant memories of the old wing commanders is barely scratching the surface. There's so much to this. We're going to try to go over all the major features of the game, the different aspects that will be in it that you can play around with, but we're nowhere going to come even close to explaining everything. So what you can do is when you see a feature you're interested in, there may be a link on the screen and you can click that to find another video that we've put together explaining in detail that specific feature. To start off, Kalathulu is going to give us a rundown of the combat. Spaceship combat has been described as a World War II in space, but when you want to take the kitty gloves off, it has a full Newtonian physics engine ready to go. Tactical FPS combat for situations where you want to board and capture. Whip out that pistol and kick some ass. And we're showing you some of that combat right now. You can see in the footage that we've shown, and all the footage we will show in this entire video is all rendered in real time in the game engine. This is not a cutscene. This is what the game will look like. This is how beautiful the CryEngine 3 can get if you put tons and tons of polygons onto ships because there's nothing else in space to render. This game has something for everyone. They've implemented pure, open-world PvP for hardcore PvPers, but it does include civilized areas where attacking another player can cause all kinds of problems and it's heavily patrolled by the NPC militaries. Lawless systems where you'll find pirates, pirates, and more pirates, but in those systems you'll also find new worlds, new civilizations, and alien relics. Speaking of lost alien civilizations, Star Citizen is going to support a robust exploration and detection system. There are many things in the game that are going to start not having been found, and the players are going to have to go out and search for them, including entire star systems that are going to be somewhere in space that humans have not yet colonized, and players will be able to find those, and the first player to find the jump point and get to a brand new star system gets to name that star system. Speaking of players, you are your character. There are no character levels. The game has been built where player skill and not attributes are what determine the outcome of any given fight. That's right. Your player does not level up. There's nothing like character levels in the game. You're not tweaking and customizing a character. Instead, you're tweaking and customizing your ship. You can decide exactly what you want on there. The trade-offs. Do you want bigger guns giving you a bigger signature, making it easier for you to be seen? Or do you want to put a smaller power plant and get a stealth profile so you can sneak up on people? Or maybe you're going to choose to overclock one of your uh, one of your weapons but then that increases the chance that it might overheat or fail during combat all of these different things that you can tweak and customize on your ship will be available to you instead of tweaking a character in fact much of the game you'll be acquiring new ships and learning to fly them but the very largest ships are not available to purchase you have to find those a derelict relic floating among the stars take on the NPC militaries, capture their ship, or board and capture another player's capital ship they already took from somebody else. It's up to you entirely. In addition, these larger capital ships are going to have systems that require a team of players working together in order to fly well. You could be part of a team of five or ten people flying in Idris. Some people are manning the turrets, some people are in the engineering bay trying to tweak and get the get all the power that Scotty can bring to bear, and then some other people are going to be in the bridge trying to make sure that the, the, the engines are functioning correctly. It's all going to come together very much like Guns of Icarus. If you've played that game and you liked it, you're going to like flying in the capital ships. And that's right, Bridger. With all that combat going on, eventually you're going to get hurt, you might even die. And this game features an innovative mechanic to handle player injury and death. 
Players who eventually die will pass on their belongings to a designated heir, but before that happens, you might find yourself waking up with new scars, bionic replacement limbs, and all other manner of things showing just what kind of hardened badass you are. And since you've got all those scars, you're going to need somebody to show them off to. That's why the game has robust support for organizations, corporations, guilds, syndicates, whatever you want to call them. It's all going to be built into the game. You're going to have recruitment setups, forums and communications. You're going to be able to make battle plans. You're going to be able to put in your structures, your roles, your responsibilities, scheduling. It's all going to be built into the game. No using those stupid engine sites for your guild. It's going to be in the game and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be functional and you are going to have a lot of fun playing around with it. And your organization is going to share a single persistent universe with everybody else's organization. Thousands, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of other players all competing at the same time in the same universe. But if you want to take it a little slower or you've got a certain setup you want, you can set up your own private server. You can test, you can train, you can go ahead and practice that boarding action and take on anybody else at any time. And what are these organizations going to be doing? Well, you've got uh, mercantile trade, you've got mining, you've got uh, mercenary work, and of course, crime. Let's be bad guys. Why not? You can go ahead and do that. You can set up your own crime syndicate in the complex supply and demand economic system. NPCs and players are going to be working together to try and make money in this persistent universe. There's going to be mining that needs to be done, but then that needs to be transported to the right places. And once it gets there, it gets turned into uh, raw materials and, and ores and goods. And then you move those from place to place. And of course, pirates looking for a quick buck can easily come in, swoop in and try to take up the traders and grab all their stuff and sell it to a fence somewhere. But those can be NPC pirates, or maybe they'll be player pirates, and maybe you'll be the part of a group who's trying to protect a convoy of NPCs as a player in order to get the pirates and get bounties. There's all kinds of different things you can do, and this complex supply and demand economic system will work exactly as you expect. And how do you play this game? Well, this game supports a variety of interface systems. Everything from the arcade-style keyboard and mouse to the full-on HOTAS joystick, foot pedals, rudders, build your own cockpit. You can even get the full virtual reality experience with the Oculus Rift. Number four, crowdfunding. So, Calithulu, the game has raised over $32 million as of the 26th of November. It's easily going to hit 33, 34, maybe even 35 before the end of the year. What that means is that they don't need a publisher. They don't need outside investors holding the purse strings for them. How does that help us as a consumer? Well, it means they're not going to be pressured to cut any kind of feature. I mean, you look at Chris Roberts' experience when he released Freelancer, and he had to go from what he wanted to be a full-fledged space sim, flight economic sim, to what came down to a very arcadey, kind of light and easy game that you know wasn't really what he wanted. He lo lost his creative freedom to make the game he wanted to make when they forced him to kick it out the door. That's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the main thing that publishers do is provide the purse strings, and whoever controls the purse strings gets to decide how the game is developed, and that means they get to choose that, oh, that feature, while it may make a lot of people happy, it's only going to sell us an extra 5% copies. It's not worth spending all the time on, so let's get rid of it and kick it out the door. Anybody who's played Rome 2 knows the problems that can be introduced by publishers. <laughs> and of course, in this case, the purse string is you and I and the 300,000 plus people that have also donated the game to one degree or another. So there's not going to be kicking out the door because while all of us would like the game as soon as possible, most of us want it to be the complete product that we were promised. The product that was envisioned by... Number three, Chris Roberts. Now, Chris Roberts is has, is has a very large pedigree as far as space sims goes. If you can think of pretty much any space sim from back in the 90s, you're probably thinking of a game that he made. The Wing Commander series, one of the very highest critically acclaimed space sims. Also, Freelancer and Privateer. These are games which people loved, and they disappeared from the market for years and years, and he is here to try and bring it back. This is his genre for all intents and purposes, and uh, that it makes him a perfect person to shepherd it back into the limelight. 
Shepard came back, especially after he was told there was no market for the kind of game he wanted to make. You know, he has a huge amount of creativity with these games. You know, he invented the genre to start with. It's just as well he resurrects it here because he has been making these games for 20 years. And he's been away for so many years. He's been, he, this is his vision that he has been refining for 10 plus years. This is the game he wanted to make when he was making Wing Commander and Freelancer and Privateer, but he couldn't because technology limited him. But now we're in the age of massively multiplayer games where he is able to actually put these things together and create his vision. Number two, open development. I mean, if you go to the Robert Space Industries website. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of articles that talk about the universe, that talk about what their vision is for what this game is going to play like. And, and there are articles that talk about the history of the universe and Jump Point comes out and it's basically showing everyone what is going on in their studio. In fact, haven't they walked us through their studio on, on the podcast? Well, they've done it on the podcast, and they've, they've had uh, some of their biggest fans show up at their L.A. and their Austin offices. I mean, they have been nothing but open about where their money is going. I mean, even listening in each of the funding goals to um, how it is that they're going to uh, improve the game with each and every new milestone that's reached. Uh, and moreover, because they have so many fans, they got open development and early development, we've all had the opportunity to walk through some of the modules. The first module out, the hangar module, bug after bug, geometry errors. This isn't to say they don't develop well, but they have thousands, tens of thousands of early testers guaranteeing a more stable product on release. Absolutely. Because of this sort of staggered module release system, we're, we've got the hangar module now, we're going to get the dogfighting module later this year, we're going to get uh, the sort of ground-based trading uh, and, and hub information module sometime early next year, and then eventually we'll get to the point where we combine all the disparate elements into the final game. And finally, the number one reason to be interested in Star Citizen. Tales of Citizens. Hi, Bridger here in the flesh to tell you why Tales of Citizens, my podcast, is the number one reason to be interested in Star Citizen. Is it because I'm an egomaniac? Maybe a little bit, but more to the point. I'm a jaded gamer. I've played so many games that it's really hard for me to get excited about something new because I've seen it all before. So I haven't done a real podcast about anything since Guild Wars 2. And before that, it was, it was Company of Heroes. There were just years of gaps where I wasn't passionate about a game enough to do a podcast for. And I love doing this, but I have to be interested in a game enough to do it. So if you can get me, the procrastinating lazy guy, interested in something enough to not only spend money on a pre-order, but spend more money than two games worth on a, on a single game, then go through all the trouble of making a new podcast, finding co-hosts, getting the artwork done, getting the branding out there, doing all the promotion and recording a show every two weeks. If you can get me to do that, there's something to it. Really, that's, that's what it all comes down to, is I don't get interested in games easy, so if I'm interested, there's probably something to this. Um, maybe you don't agree, maybe you can do your own research, the same research I did, and, and you come to a different conclusion, that's fine. Everybody's got different tastes. But, uh, I would be willing to wager this game is going to really make waves when it comes out, um, if not before. So, we'll see. And the other reason that Tales of Citizens is the number one reason to be interested in the show is because it's going to be a fantastic show. It is a fantastic show. We've already done two full episodes, and you can check them out at the Sound Strategy Network YouTube webpage. You can also find them at talesofcitizens.com, which will hopefully be our webpage coming up soon. Uh, but the audio feed is in the, 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 the description of all the videos for the, for the podcast episodes. Um, we are basically focusing on the deep questions. There's a lot of other podcasts out there. Some of them focus exclusively on news. The Hull Truth is one that comes to mind. They specifically talk about new information that's come from the devs since the last show. That's great. That's a really useful resource. That's not what we're doing at Tales of Citizens. At Tales of Citizens, what we're trying to do more than anything else is examine things and in an insightful, in, in, a, in, in informative way. 
hopefully after listening to the show, you're going to come out of that show having learned something very subtle or different, or maybe we changed your mind about something, right? We've got very uh, informed people on the show that are not experts, but enthusiasts of game design that really know what we're talking about. And that's what makes the show great. We ask the really deep questions and we try to explore and find the really interesting answers. We try to have the most interesting and entertaining discussion as possible. I mean, we'll crack jokes. We'll talk about funny moments. We'll make references to geek and nerd humor. We'll talk. We'll make Star Trek and Star Wars jokes and Babylon 5 and whatever. But, uh, but the most important draw of the show, I think, and what I'm hoping to make it happen is, is to make it the deep questions. That's really what it's all about. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy that show and enjoy the continuation of this series, Star Citizen Boot Camp. Uh, we will be, again, continuing going over all in more detail all of the things we talked about in reason number five, the ambitious scale. We'll be doing an episode about how uh, your ship fits together and how you can build it. We'll be doing an episode about how the death mechanic works. We'll be doing an episode about how the economy works, etc., etc. Uh, so if you're looking for little five minute videos that'll get you up to speed, this series is going to be fantastic for that. The podcast won't be, we're not going to be going over every little detail on the podcast. We're going to be discussing them as if you already know about the stuff that's in this boot camp. That's why we're making the boot camp. We're making star citizen boot camp so that you can watch it and be prepared to listen to the discussions that happen on the podcast. And you can watch that show every other Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is minus 5 from UTC, if that helps. Uh, we do record every other Sunday. Right now it's December 1st. We just finished recording a show. Uh, so the next one we will be recording will be on the 15th of December and then every other week from then on. Uh, so thank you guys for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you liked it. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. This is the show where we sell people on the game. If after this show, you're not sold on Star Citizen, you probably never will be. Maybe it's not for you. That's fine. That's what we're going to do today.